Thank you for joining us today as we talk about music and mental health. And when we scheduled this program, we did not know that we'd be going into lockdown for another couple of weeks. So I'm hoping that it will be as pertinent as ever um, and that you'll be able to take away some tools for ways to incorporate music into your own health and well-being. Um, I'm hoping you can't hear this snowplow outside my room and that you're cozy at home, um, maybe with a cup of coffee. And as we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that Laurier's campuses are located on the traditional land of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and neutral peoples. Acknowledging them reminds us of our important connection to the land where we live, work, and learn. We recognize, honor, and respect these nations as the traditional stewards of the land and water. If you're joining us from another location, I would encourage you to take a moment to, to honor the Indigenous people who have lived where you reside. And I would also encourage all of us who have settled on this land to learn and reflect on how we can contribute to reconciliation in a way that goes beyond land acknowledgements. I'm Avalon Harris, a 2014 graduate of Laurier's Music Therapy Program. I own a music therapy practice in the GTHJ called Symmetry Music. And I also work at a hospice and run a program for young women with anxiety called Sing It Girls. Today, we'll start by hearing from our two panelists and then get into some dialogue and audience questions. Please feel free to type questions into the chat. There's a little box um, and we will answer them as we have time after hearing from both panelists. So to begin the conversation, I will introduce you to Esther Abel and Elizabeth Mitchell. Esther is a PhD candidate in social psychology at Wilfrid Laurier University, currently focusing on the individual differences in attitudes and opinions people have regarding happiness and well being in different contexts. Esther completed her Bachelor of Science in Psychology at Cape Breton University in Nova Scotia. She also has her Master's of Science in Applied Positive Psychology and Coaching Psychology from the University of East London in England and her Master's of Arts in Social Psychology from Laurier. So thanks for joining us, Esther. And Elizabeth Mitchell is here with us today as well. Elizabeth is a Laurier Master of Music Therapy graduate as well as a current assistant professor at Laurier where she coordinates the Bachelor of Music Therapy program. Elizabeth is a registered psychotherapist and certified music therapist. From 2017 to 2020, she was Laurier's first music therapist in residence. So I'll turn it over to Esther now. And as she is speaking, you might have some questions. So just pop them into the chat. And after she speaks, we will get to that. All right. Hello, everyone. Hopefully you can all see me and see the screen and the slides and everything. All right. Uh, if not, feel free to pop it in the chat and let the organizers know and they might be able to help. Uh, so uh, welcome. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking to you about music and well-being. Uh, so um, leading you, I'm going to be leading you through what well-being is, how it can be altered, and how music can kind of tie into everything and be a really important way uh, in um, contributing to or talking about well-being. So there's a lot of different ways that we talk about well-being and the words we, we use to do so. And well-being is the main focus of my field, positive psychology. And what we aim to do is to research well-being, to understand what it looks like in people's lives, and to use what we learn to help increase it in others. So before we talk about increasing well-being, we have to understand what it looks like. So when we talk about well-being, we can kind of broadly divide it into two categories to help understand the differences between types of well-being. And the two categories we can divide it into are hedonic and eudaimonic well-being. 
So hedonic well-being refers to positive, happy moments that are surface and temporary. So. so this may look like having fun, having a laugh, or something that makes you smile. This type of happiness or well-being is typically immediate, but also a temporary pleasure. So the second type of well-being is eudaimonic, and that's the feeling of living life in a meaningful, fulfilling, or deeply satisfying way. So you could consider someone who runs a marathon, who finishes first and collapses exhausted. This person might not feel much hedonic happiness at all. They're in pain, they're exhausted, they're not smiling, they're not feeling great, they're not having a fun, great time. But they feel happy, and that's due to feeling deeply accomplished and proud. Um, and that's a different feeling than happiness that is just cheerful or just feels good. So from these two types, we can kind of understand that there are different experiences of well-being and they're not just tied to kind of our immediate emotion or mood or just how we're feeling in the moment. They can be deeper or different experiences depending on the moment and on the situation. So in this way, eudaimonic well-being is related to the true self and to fulfilling goals or meaningful achievement and feeling a deep sense of satisfaction. So when it comes to music, it could provide you with well-being in different ways. And this could be as hedonic happiness, maybe something like jamming out and playing just to have fun. Or not having such a fun time, but practicing because the achievement of mastering a complex piece is deeply meaningful to you. Both ways as well can be increased or altered. So Lubomirsky and Leos's research shows that well-being or happiness can be built or increased through simple activities or small changes. And we can integrate the things that bring us joy into our lives to increase happiness, be that hedonic, eudaimonic, or both. There is so much research on music, but a small finding is that engaging with music can increase emotional competence, subjective happiness, and decrease anxiety symptoms. One thing that can impact this is the person activity fit. That is, the better the activity fits the person, the more effectively it will increase well being. And that's why different activities can have different effects on your well being. So, no matter what type of well being music brings to you, we can consider how we prioritize musical activities to enhance our well being. So, there's a lot of different ways we can enhance our well being with music. And I'm going to explore three of them uh, with you today. So the first thing that you can do to enhance your well-being with music is to find an activity that fits you. So find an activity that has the right dosage, or in other words, how often you engage with it, the right level of social support involved, and the right amount of variety for you in order to increase your well-being with it. So this could look like an activity that you do all the time, alone, focused on maybe one specific genre of music. Or it could look like an activity you do less often with friends trying out many genres and styles. So in this way, those two examples vary your dosage or how often you engage with it, the level of social support, so who is with you? Are you engaging with other people? Are you just going about this activity alone? As well as the variety. Is it something you want to stick to just doing the same activity in the same kind of style? Or do you want like a lot of variety with the way you engage with music? So either way, the key is to choose an activity that you enjoy and reprioritize it in your own mind. So think of it as something fun you get to do that you enjoy and you'll find it easier to stick to and more fun when you approach it with that mindset. So the second way we can enhance our well-being with music is to leverage our motivation. And motivation can be very hard to work with. Um, but if we understand what's in the way of our motivation, it can help us. So for example, there may be any or all of, of these motivational barriers in, the, in your way when you consider taking up any activity that you consider might help your well-being. Be that music or anything like that, um, you may consider, oh, I really want to play the guitar, but I just don't have enough time, and also I don't own a guitar. So those are two uh, motivational barriers that might be in your way to achieving that activity um, in the way that you want to. 
But if you understand which motivational barriers are in your way, you can create thoughts and systems to overcome them. So for example, if you want to play your guitar, but you have the motivational barriers of having no energy for it after work and no time to practice due to a busy schedule, then maybe it may help to schedule half an hour on a Saturday morning to just playing guitar. So planning ahead in this way may help you overcome those motivational barriers. And it may be trial and error to figure out how that works for you and how to specifically address and work with the motivational barriers you have. The first time you try to create a system, it may not work. Um, and that's because those motivational barriers are there for a reason. They're probably things that you consider important getting in the way or there are legitimate concerns. But they sometimes are concerns that you can kind of cross or deal with if you um, you know, create some systems in your life to address them and understand what they are. So next, to also leverage motivation, you can keep, to, keep in mind an end goal and set SMART goals in order to get to that end goal. So this may be especially important if music brings you eudaimonic happiness. And so it may seem like a chore in the short term and you don't want to do it, but you know that ultimately it's good for you or it's something you enjoy in the long term and it brings you a sense of satisfaction or meaning in your life. So if that's true, it may be hard to stick to that in the short term. And that's certainly true of a lot of things in our lives. So one way to get around that is to keep that end goal in mind and then to set SMART goals. So what do I mean when I say SMART goals? Well, SMART goals are small goals that are specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and time-bound. So instead of setting a non-SMART goal like, I'll practice my flute sometime this month, you set the SMART goal that you'll practice for 30 minutes on Tuesday and then have dinner. In this way, you're setting a specific, realistic goal that is also something you can achieve. These goals can help you achieve steps along the way to a greater goal, and that can enhance the well-being you feel from it and also help you stick to an activity, which is sometimes very hard to do, especially in these times. So next, we can enhance our well-being with music by focusing on successes instead of failures. So say you intended to practice your flute five times this week, but only did practice twice. So instead of beating yourself up over it and fixating on the failed days and why it all went wrong and how you're awful for not practicing and all of that, instead, consider your successes. So how did you successfully practice twice? What situation made that happen? How could you learn from that situation and recreate that situation to succeed again? What can we learn from our successes instead of just always fixating on failures? Similarly, you can look at how you've su successfully formed or maintained habits throughout your whole life and try to understand what works for you and how you can leverage that again. And one thing you could also look at is through which strengths did your successes occur? So this is a classification of human strengths from positive psychology. So say you're someone who has the strength of teamwork. Maybe it would be more successful to play an instrument with a group rather than alone. Or say you have the strength of judgment, then instead of passively listening to an album, maybe it will bring you more well-being to write a blog post about it or to critically analyze it with a music club. The Via, the Via Character website, which is at the top of the screen now, um, has a quiz to find out your strengths, but you may be aware of some of them already. And you could try to focus on them to enjoy and stick to activities easier because they'll feel more natural because they're in line with the things you already value and the things you already enjoy. So finally, the last way, last way we can enhance our well-being with music is to look at the research on music and the work being done in the field of music therapy, which Dr. Elizabeth Mitchell will talk to you about momentarily. So in summary, today I discussed how music can bring us different types of happiness and finding ways to integrate it into our lives is a great way to increase well-being. And motivation can be hard, especially now given the situations we're all in, but focusing on your goals, choosing an activity you enjoy, and focusing on success can help you integrate the source of well-being into your life. So thank you so much, and I welcome any questions that you may have for me during the question period, or you may be typing into the question box now. So for now, I'll turn it back over to Avalon. Thank you so much, Esther.
Um, I really like the idea of looking at your character's strengths and then tailoring your um, activities and self-care to that. So thank you for that. Um, so yeah, just a reminder, keep putting questions into the chat and after Elizabeth shares, we will get to that. So I'll turn it over now to Elizabeth. Okay, there we go. I think that's working. There was just a bit of a delay there. Um, please let me know, Avalon, if for any reason you're not seeing my screen. It's really an honor. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, really an honor to be here today. Um, and thanks, Esther, um, for uh, all of the insights and wisdom you shared from the fields of positive psychology, which I think is going to intersect um, really meaningfully with what I'm going to talk about. As, as Esther mentioned, which is um, research from the field of music therapy and music and health specifically. So as Avalon mentioned earlier, I um, am a registered psychotherapist and a certified music therapist. And I've worked as a music therapist primarily in mental health treatment settings with um, folks of a wide variety of ages from children up until older adults, and also have some experience working in retirement home settings as well. And it's really a pleasure now to be working as an assistant professor at Laurier, um, coordinating the Bachelor of Music Therapy program. So we're gonna talk briefly today about music's therapeutic value and how this is linked to, to music therapy as a profession, but also a bit distinct from that as well. I'm gonna share briefly about my own research interests, and then I'm gonna share with you some research-based tips around how we can use music in our everyday lives for our own health and wellness, specific to listening, to instrument playing, and then also to singing. So I'm gonna invite you maybe for just 20 or 30 seconds to reflect, and if you're you know, in a room with somebody else, you can chat about it for a few seconds as well, about the role that music plays in your own life and how is music therapeutic for you or perhaps for somebody that you love. Um, regardless of whether or not you have any formal training or experience in music. So how do you find music therapeutic? And certainly for me, I can think about the ways that I choose the music I listen to quite intentionally. Sometimes it's to maybe lift my mood. Sometimes it might be to relax. Sometimes it might be to um, actually reflect and express something I'm feeling in the moment. I also play the piano and I love to sing, and those are um, ways that I am creative. Those are ways that I can express emotions, ways I can communicate with others. And I do love to connect with others through music making. So not just to do music by myself, but to do music in community. And those are just some, that is some of how I would answer that question, although there are many others um, as well. So I, as we're talking today, I encourage you to keep thinking about how is music therapeutic for you? And as we establish that music can be therapeutic, that can help us in a variety of ways in our lives, um, and it's some, it's a kind of abstract thing to think about, um, but that it's that help is somehow different or distinguished from the sounds themselves. So we experience something in music that we might say is extra musical. It's outside of the sounds that I hear in the music, but I experience something in addition to that from the experience of being in music. And music therapy as a discipline is totally connected to that, although also at the same time a bit distinct, distinct from that as well. So music therapy as a discipline, as defined by the Canadian Association for Music Therapists, involves work with certified music therapists who use music purposefully within a therapeutic relationship to ultimately work towards human development, health and well-being. And music therapists are, are bound to work safely and ethically with people to address needs in a very wide variety of domains. So those might be physical needs, cognitive, social, emotional, and so on. So at its essence then, how do we define music therapy? And for me, the most easy way to do that, the easiest way to define music therapy is to just note that there are three essential elements in any music therapy setting. There's always going to be music present, a client or a group of clients and a therapist. And this seems like such an oversimplification, I'm sure, but it's helpful for me to be able to distinguish, okay, so if I'm listening to music at the end of a busy day at work to just chill out and relax, that is absolutely the therapeutic application of music, but it's not music therapist because music therapy, sorry, because there isn't a client therapist relationship going on. It's just me by myself with my musical engagement. So to expand on those areas a bit further, 
A music therapist always has training and certification. In Canada, that looks like they've completed a university program in music therapy, and they have that MTA credential, the music therapist accredited, which means they've done an internship and written an exam. Therapists always are goal-oriented in their work, so very intentionally working with their clients for specific areas of health and well-being. Therapists are bound by ethical standards of their profession, and also therapists um, collaborate to form therapeutic relationships with their clients. And we know that the therapeutic relationship is a really important part of the success of any therapy. Clients, on the other hand, are seeking some type of greater health and wellness. And there's, a, as I said before, a huge variety of what that can involve. And clients can be from a very wide variety of clinical contexts. So music therapists in Canada work in special education, in hospitals, in oncology, in palliative care, in long-term care, in rehabilitation, in forensic settings, in community settings, the list goes on and on. So there's a very wide application of um, music therapy. Clients always provide consent to participate in therapy, and the client is hopefully collaborating with their therapist um, to um, meaningfully direct the process. And finally, the music. The music in music therapy may be active or receptive. So sometimes the client is actively participating in making music with the therapist, and sometimes the client might be receiving the music, so more from a listening perspective. And the music in music therapy can look like the music in our lives. So it might be improvised, it might be recreated, it might be um, listened to, it might be an original composition. There's, there's um, a lot of different ways that the music can look in music therapy settings. In terms of my own research, I've conducted research and I'm involved in research right now surrounding music psychotherapy and mental health treatment, specifically around eating disorders treatment and also mood disorders, and also community music therapy. So working with an entire community, taking music therapy outside of the clinical therapy space. Um, and I have two, um, two articles that have been published surrounding the role of performance specifically in music therapy settings. I'm also really interested in the connections between music therapy, community music, and music education, and the role of relationship and music in each setting. And so even though music therapy, as I started today, does have these distinguishing factors that make it unique, I also see it as entirely connected to these other places in our lives where we make music and form relationships with other people, which is also relevant to our talk today, that the benefits we can experience in our everyday lives from music are totally connected to the ways that music therapists use music in that goal-directed way within a therapy session. So music in everyday life, what can, what can I do? What can you do to enhance your own, your own wellness in music? So as we've established, all those things that music therapists do are unique, but also connected to the ways that we use music in our lives. You're absolutely going to get unique benefits if you choose to work from a, work with a music therapist because music therapists have this specialized training and because the therapy setting is totally focused on you and your needs. And music is music and you can intentionally work with music to bring about greater wellness in your own life. And I would say the first thing to do if you have a belief that you can't do this, if you can't engage with music, especially actively, so maybe singing or playing an instrument, because you don't have formal training, because you don't have that experience, you can challenge this as, I would say, a lie that our society tells us about musical participation. Music is not just the domain, a domain for pop stars and people who've been taking like private lessons since they were five years old. And the concept of talent is actually a pretty shaky one from a research perspective. There are absolutely people that are born with tremendous proclivity for music, but for most of us, the people that are labeled as talented are actually the people that have had a lot of opportunity and from there have taken that opportunity and have worked hard. Um, so know that the research really supports that for the vast majority of human beings, you've been born with musical potential and um, musical capacity. So one thing you can do is listen with intention. And I talked about this already a little bit. A scholar that I really appreciate, Evan Rood, talks about developing what he calls a musical home pharmacy. And so you can think about um, the ways that, you know, you might have that medicine cabinet with, you know, pills for various aches and pains. And the same idea with, with music that you can ahead of time, ahead of when you need it, 
think about the music that affords or benefits you in different ways. So music that's maybe helpful for, re for relaxation versus music that helps to motivate you and energize you and collect that music um, so that you're ready to use it when you need it. And you can get ideas from the internet, get ideas from loved ones, and also remember that your musical tastes are individual. Sometimes when I look up, you know, if I Google music for relaxation, some of the music that Google suggests to me is not music that I actually can relate to or enjoy. So if your tastes are different, totally fine. That relates to your own values and experiences and cultural upbringing. There's no one size fits all here. You can create intentional playlists and those playlists can evoke or create a specific unified mood or a playlist can also be used to shift from one mood to another. So to start with from a place of validation and then to move to where you want to be from a mood perspective. And important when we're listening to take care of ourselves, recognizing that music can evoke any and all emotions. And that goes back to that idea of that our musical tastes are so personal. And so a, a piece of music that really lifts my mood might actually um, trigger a challenging memory or emotion for you because of an association you have with that piece. So again, something to just take care of yourself in and recognize that the power of music means that it can be used to both enhance mood, but then also at times it can it can um, challenge us as well and actually um, have a negative impact on mood. In terms of the research on singing, there's some really amazing research um, that was done with saliva samples of, of choral singers to show the ways that group singing actually positively impacts the immune system. We know that um, singing also has a positive response on um, lung capacity and, and breathing. So there are real physical benefits to singing. And in groups and in group choral settings as well and group singing settings, we know that there's this increase in well-being on a variety of levels. So on a social level, physical level, there's cognitive stimulation, benefits to mental health, enjoyment and recreation. And also often in singing, I, I, there can be a sense of a greater spiritual connection with others or with a higher power, a sense of transcendence. And finally, learning to play an instrument, or if you already play an instrument, as Esther talked about, getting back and maybe um, starting to play that instrument again. Um, learning, musical learning through music lessons can foster a sense of personal growth and personal accomplishment alongside the, the literal musical growth that's happening. And there's some really great research of older adults participating in instrumental learning um, through a band setting. And um, the following areas of benefit were identified physical and cognitive health, emotional health, that that benefit of skill building and feeling accomplished, and also the social and cultural benefits of making music with others. And also um, play around with improvisation. There's something very unique in the experience of making something up spontaneously versus playing music that's already been written. And that experience of creativity can lead us into that flow state where we're no longer thinking in that analytical way, but actually accessing a more kind of playful in the moment um, state of being that is that is quite unique to improvisation. And so any of these things are, are certainly possible. So I just want to end here by saying and reiterating that music's benefits for health and well-being are available to, to anybody. And also want to end by recognizing that this isn't something you have to do alone. And as we talk about habit formation today, um, certainly in, this, in the midst of this pandemic, it can be really challenging, as Esther talked about, to have that motivation to... Um, to increase our own well-being all in isolation. So if that's something you're struggling with, um, music is so much a relational and social art form. So if there's a way you can do that with others, recognizing this period of lockdown, but even if it's with one other person, um, that can be a really positive way to know that this isn't something that has to be an individual effort. You can reach out for, for support, whether that's from a healthcare professional or from a loved one in your life. So I'm gonna turn this back now to, um, to Avalon and uh, feel free to pop any questions into that question and answer um, box and I'll look forward to engaging with those. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, you both, Esther and Elizabeth, both touched on um, having an instrument that you may not have touched for years and I can't 
think of how many people I know who say they have a guitar in the basement collecting dust. So hopefully some of us will be inspired to pick that up again. We've had some comments and questions come in, so we're going to take some time to get to those now. Um, Louisa had a comment about creating specific playlists for specific moods, um, and you talked talk about that too, Elizabeth. I do that as well, Louisa. Um, it's so nice to have that at your fingertips when you're feeling grumpy or lazy or whatever, just picking a playlist to suit your mood. Um, and thank you, Catherine, for your comment on um, the impact of a personal fit, like Esther was talking about. Um, happiness is not one size fits all, it's really a personal um, endeavor. Um, we also had a really important question come in from Bethany. So I'll start with that. She was um, mentioning, which is really true and important, that the ability to spend time and resources on our well being is actually quite a privilege. And the pandemic is really highlighting some of the inequities that marginalized communities face when they're seeking treatment, physical or mental health treatment. So I'm hoping that we can hear from both of you on some of the systemic barriers to health and well being. So, whoever wants to start. Sure. Yeah, I can. I can start. Yeah. Thank you. Is it is it Bethany? You said Alan that asked that. Yeah. Thanks for that question. And that's actually, it's why I said what I did at the very end. That like habit formation. We're talking about it as such an individual thing, but it's actually so much more complex than that. So I really appreciate that you brought that brought that out. Um, I find myself often kind of bristling at the word self care these days because it's such it puts that emphasis on the individual and it can make people feel like okay i'm doing all of these things and um i'm not feeling better so therefore like i'm to blame rather than recognizing all of the social and societal factors that also play into our well-being and that aren't evenly distributed as you pointed out so that um, access to resources for health and well-being are are um in many ways, an incredibly privileged thing. So I'm standing here talking, but I mean, I, I'm employed by a university. I have access to a university health health benefits, for example, right? Which allows me to maybe access psychotherapy. I could access the services of a music therapist um, and have it partially covered by my employer. That's a privilege that many people don't have. So I fully recognize that. And um, yeah, so I think that's just a really important part of the conversation and we can continue to talk about that. Um, certainly knowing about resources from a musical perspective that are available in the community free of charge, recognizing that finances are a huge barrier always, and that's just been highlighted during the pandemic. So certainly in the Waterloo region, a resource, for example, the community, school, community music school of Waterloo region is a community music school that um, has an affiliation with Laurier that actually offers music lessons free of charge to children in the community who wouldn't be able to access them otherwise. So, and there are many therapists that operate from a sliding scale. So being aware of those types of resources, recognizing those inequities is um, really important. Um, and also I recognize that, you know, in terms of accessing healthcare, many folks from marginalized communities, so people with disabilities, um, persons of color, people from the LGBTQ community have often experienced stigma in healthcare. And so reaching out to that therapist might be really challenging um, due to that and finding someone that is a good fit. So there's there's that and also, yeah, on a musical level, certainly speaking as a university employee, we know that um, university music programs have traditionally privileged music from Western European traditions. And so there have historically been barriers um, for to accessing, um, well, music in a lot of societal institutions for people that don't come from that particular musical background or don't have the haven't had the opportunity to train in that background of music. So, and it, I will say that I'm heartened to see that that's that's changing in real time. And there's amazing research and amazing policy change going on to try to level the playing field and and really celebrate the musics from a wide variety of of um, traditions. But those are just some of the barriers I see, and I I recognize that. Um, major inroads are being made and we're recognizing the issues but i um there's still lots of work to do of course so the p topic i'm very passionate about but esther you go ahead because <laughs> that's, that's no i think 
I think that was a great answer. That was so interesting and comprehensive. I think I only have a small thing to add to that, which is just that on that piece about self-care, which is, I think, really interesting and such a big topic of conversation these days. And I think an important thing to keep in mind is that self-care doesn't have to be one particular thing. It doesn't have to look like one, you know, way to do something or it has to be like, you know, taking a big bath at the end of the day or anything like that, like that it seems to be sometimes. Self-care is just what is good for you and what takes care of you and no matter what that looks like. And that can be taking just five minutes to have a breath or it can be scheduling out an hour to do something you love. And of course, it can kind of work into your schedule too. It has, it doesn't have to be perfect. And I think that's what's key to a lot of people think self-care has to be this perfect activity that we engage in that looks very lovely and aesthetic and beautiful. But self-care really is at the base just what is something that's going to help you. And that might not even be something physical. It could be something emotional. It could be something just, you know, taking a mental break or anything like that. It doesn't have to be so formal either. And I think that goes back to what Elizabeth talked about with um, music and how we don't have to consider music to be this perfect activity that only people who are really, really good at it can engage in, but rather something that we can you know, come into with joy and just do for fun. Um, and I think that's a great way to approach music in a way that can be very self-caring without it having to be very formal. So maybe that's just like getting a few plastic instruments together and just playing some music with your kids. You know, if that's something you enjoy and it sounds awful, that's completely fine, you know, as long as you enjoy it and as long as you're doing an activity that kind of brings you that well-being and then that, you know, level of happiness or peace or anything like that, I think that's what's really important. And um, and it certainly is really hard to get that these days sometimes with all the different life circumstances we have and the barriers that are in place right now. Um, and I think that even with this newest lockdown, they're even more apparent with a lot of people. So finding the time to carve out for self-care can sometimes be impossible uh, or seem impossible, but uh, certainly going into it with the mindset that it doesn't have to be perfect, it doesn't have to be one size fits all or anything like that can help in trying to approach it in a way that works for you. Absolutely, thank you, Esther. Yeah, I love that the research shows no matter how bad you sound when you sing, how bad you sound, it still is just as beneficial. Um, thank you, Joe, for your comment. We're getting some really great questions and comments. Joe was just mentioning how watching and engaging in live music has been such a, a mood booster and such a positive way to connect socially as well, for sure. Um, there's a question for you, Elizabeth. Um, someone was wondering if music therapists work with high performing athletes. For example, sometimes when you're watching the Olympics, you can see the athletes like listening to their playlist right up to the last second. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, what an interesting question. I actually don't know. That's my honest answer to that question. I haven't, I can't think of any examples that I've heard. That doesn't mean that they don't. Um, and certainly there is a lot of interesting research that, um, parallels the types of training that athletes do with what high performing musicians do. I remember my piano teacher like 30 years ago introducing me to a book called The Inner Game of Music that was based on a book that had been written called The Inner Game of Tennis. <laughs> and so it was about the, um, yeah, about the parallels of that high performance kind of and that like the mental state that one needs to be in to be that focused whether you're a tennis player or, you know, a performing musician, that's a little bit different than your question. But I certainly think there are um, parallels between um, the athletic world and the, mus the musical world. But that's something I would have to look up. I have not heard of an example of a music therapist specifically working with high performing athletes. But I think there's that's an interesting that would be a great research topic. So <laughs> thanks for that idea. Yeah, I'm not sure I've heard of that either, but I know for myself, if I'm trying to go for a run without music, then it's no, no go. <laughs> um, so a question for you, Esther. So your research is really centered around looking at the individual differences in happiness and motivation. So I'm just wondering how strongly correlated motivation and happiness are. You did speak to this when you were sharing, but um, are there any practical things we can do if we really, really struggle to get motivated, even when we know these things are good for us? That's a great question. And I think like, uh, 
not to give too much of a social psychologist answer, but it does vary by person. Uh, so each person is going to be a little bit different. Um, I think um, one definite key, and this is one thing I talked about in my little talk, um, but one thing I think is really important is to just do an activity you enjoy. Um, I think a lot of people, especially when it comes to music, feel like it has to be one thing. It has to be either super formal or it has to be not fun because practicing is not fun and that kind of thing. But I think um, the more you enjoy it, the more you approach it as something you get to do or you enjoy to do, the easier it is going to be to stick to it or make time for it. And I think the, the same is true if we compare it to something like exercising. Um, I think that's where a lot of like the motivation research is in because that's certainly a hard thing to motivate people to do sometimes. But if you kind of uh, go for activities that you enjoy or you add elements of what you enjoy to them, you could be more successful. So maybe watching a movie while you exercise. In the same way, maybe playing music um, or songs that you really like uh, would be a great way to kind of engage with playing an instrument more. Um, and similarly, um, I think adding elements of other things you enjoy into that experience. So if you're someone who really likes connecting with others, um, maybe ha starting something like a book club for music would be a great way to engage with music and, you know, engage with it in a different way than, you know, is traditional maybe, but also a way that you would really enjoy because talking about music can be very fun, it, depending on who you are. Uh, so I think those those kinds of things are very important. But I think beyond that, um, especially in our day to day now, um, kind of look at what you're successfully doing and how you're sticking to those kinds of things. So if you're successfully sticking to another hobby, another habit, how are you doing that? Is it something you stick to because you really schedule it out and you make time for that every single day? Or is it something that's just really easily accessible? So your guitar is set up in the living room and you can look at it every day and you see it all the time. And so you're kind of reminded uh, by it. So whatever works for you, whatever you find is, an, is effective, and that may take some trial and error with like, maybe you're someone who really hates scheduling things. So that's not gonna work for you. But trying different things and trying a good way to integrate it into your daily schedule can be a good way to keep at it. And especially these days, it's hard to have a daily schedule sometimes, but kind of creating one for yourself might be a good step towards um, integrating it into your life. Awesome. Thank you, Esther. Um, Elizabeth, I have another question for you. I'm sure that you, just like I have, um, figured out the struggles of music therapy over Zoom. Um, so we had a question um, about what makes that successful and any tips for um, whether you can like engage with clients or engage with other people over Zoom with music or if it's better to just kind of mute and listen. What are your thoughts? Uh, thanks for that question. Um, I, I mean, full disclosure, most of the pandemic, I've been in an academic role. So I have had been in the position of doing music um, and it's been in my, in my teaching, actually teaching music therapy students, musical techniques like improvisation and having to do that on Zoom <laughs> and figure that out. But at the very beginning of the pandemic, I was still employed at a mental health facility. And for um, several months, I was doing music therapy sessions with adults with mental health issues and older adults with dementia on, on Zoom. So um, I do have a little bit of experience with that before I shifted into the academic position full time at Laurier. And yeah, there are certainly barriers. And some of it, I mean, it's such a kind of banal thing to talk about but some of it really depends on the quality of the internet connection so you're going to be able to do more with your clients um depending on how you know the quality of the connection you have and also the quality of the connection they have at their end and again speaking of barriers high quality internet connection that's going to be really variable depending on whether it's an in institutional setting where your client is your home environment how many people they live with how, you know just what they can afford in terms of an internet connection um, but that's I mean so that internet connection makes a big difference in terms of being able to do music at all over over zoom or over another platform and from there I would say that I know that a lot of music therapists have had to shift their work for sure so you know music therapists that primarily when they're working in person are doing improvisation which really depends on being like in sync most of the time with people right and 
So if I'm improvising with somebody, I want them to know I've heard them and I can reflect back their musical ideas and make something that sounds musically satisfying together. That's challenging to do with latency over, over the internet. So certainly I would say that music therapists who are practicing online are largely doing less improvisation, though there is still some that's possible, more kind of call and response style improvisation where maybe I create something and then someone echoes back but we're not depending on the synchronicity of it, that can still work online. And I can speak from my own experience um, with adults with mental health issues. I certainly did a lot of um, music listening where, you know, where we shared a song together, talked about the lyrics, um, maybe guided relaxation. Yeah, like I said, lyric analysis, having people share music that's important in their lives. All of that works beautifully over the internet. Um, and in terms of group singing, yeah, typically with that, I would have people mute themselves and I would lead it while they sing and maybe play instruments on their end. But we're not, we don't all have our sound on at the same time because it, um, well, it's a bit of a cacophony if you try to do that, unfortunately. So, but certainly music therapists have adapted, I would say, beautifully to um, working remotely during the pandemic. And it just means that shift to maybe a little bit less improvisation and a bit more music listening, songwriting works really well online. There's, there are lots of things that, that certainly still, still work um, in a remote um, environment. Yeah, for sure. I have a lot can probably speak to that because you are doing music therapy like as we speak, right? So yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you definitely lose something if, if everybody has to be muted when you sing, but I know that some people actually enjoy that if they're self-conscious about their voice, they like to be able to just sing at home behind the computer. Yeah, so I think I will ask another question to Esther as we start to wrap up. So this one is really interesting to me. Um, it's about toxic positivity. I've been seeing that phrase a lot on the internet and a lot of the music that I use in sessions is around themes of hope and strength and resilience. And I'm wondering if you can tell us about toxic positivity and why we should avoid it in sessions and in our personal lives? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's a super topical um, one as well. I think toxic positivity as a term is definitely becoming more popular as people kind of, you know, kind of reach a natural reflectiveness on their own positivity um, and positivity out there as it becomes much more of a, a popular topic and just the general, you know, discourse around um how we should live and all that good stuff and self-help books grow and all that good stuff um but so toxic positivity is this kind of idea around um how we consider positivity you could say so um positivity positivity is great like you know focusing the positives um trying to be optimistic keeping hope in mind all that good stuff where it becomes toxic is where we ignore the negatives for favor of the positives so instead of saying you know um, I'm hopeful for you know the future, but I have to deal with the problems of today. I'm you would say for toxic positivity, I'm ignoring the problems, and we're only looking at the positives. And that can be a huge problem because you know you have to keep a balance. You have to be realistic with certain things, and just ignoring the negatives is not a great way to be a positive person. It's just ignoring all your problems and you know essentially you know putting putting a blinders on and not looking at anything negative and that can be very harmful so like anything it can anything can be taken to an extreme anything can be taken too far and that's certainly true of positivity or something like optimism if you're if being optimistic is great but if you're overly optimistic to the point of ignoring any naysaying any negativity that can be really damaging to other people and to yourself it can be hard to live in that way because eventually those negative things are still there. You haven't dealt with them and ignoring your problems is not a great way to solve them or really address them. Um, so that can create even more problems. So while positivity is great, positivity is not the only thing that matters. And that's certainly true in my field, in the field of positive psychology. We've always been very careful to specify that we are you know, expanding the usual scope of psychology, not trying to ignore the usual scope. Because if you have a mental illness, 
that cannot be solved by just being cheerful, by just being positive, by just having hope. That has to be solved in constructive ways and ways that psychology has studied for years. But positivity can be a helpful addition to these things. Um, there's a lot that positivity, positivity teaches us that can be really, really great for people who are struggling with, you know, uh, mental illness or anything like that. But it's not the only thing for those people. So when it comes to um, music and kind of these themes of hope and strength and resilience, those are all super, super important. But we have to also remember that they can't supersede or replace, you know, negative feelings, negative thoughts, but they can be a great way to deal with them. I think resilience in, in especially is a great way to recognize that things happen bad things occur, but we can be strong and we can cross them, we can deal with them, we can come out on the other side better, stronger, all of those things because we have resilience and we have hope. Uh, so I think that's what's really important is just keeping that balance and that's where you don't delve into the toxicness of positive positivity and also do keep an eye out for toxic positivity in your own life. I think it's especially common with a lot of self-help books now is to just tell you to just be positive and nothing else matters but that's not the best advice i would say i would say be positive that's super important but also stay realistic you know deal with problems as they come up and know that those problems are temporary and we can solve them and we can move on and we can keep a positive mindset and that's that's important as well so thank you for that question that's super interesting yeah thank you it's really interesting to hear about how important it is to validate and then move on we try to do that in music therapy too not just play a super happy song to someone who's crying because that doesn't help usually yeah so a couple more um questions and comments have come in david thank you he said um thank you for your presentations esther and elizabeth he is ready to dust off his guitar now for his health and well-being so we've inspired somebody here and we also had a really interesting comment from John. Um, he said he encourages people to listen to an inspiring or motivational song before they're um, doing a job interview or a webinar. So that's a really interesting um, thing he suggested someone could research that. I bet there might be some research about that already. Thanks, John. So we're just starting to wrap up here and I'm wondering if you can both share some more thoughts just final thoughts before we close out any anything uh so i have a question for elizabeth uh if we have a moment for that uh so my question for you is in your kind of clinical practice or academic experience that you've had, what kind of lessons have you learned from the people who successfully integrate music into their own lives in ways that elevates their personal well-being? What have you kind of learned or experienced from interacting with those kinds of people? Thanks, Esther. Um, yeah, I, my, <clears throat> excuse me, my clients have taught me so much and um, if I think of a few things, one actually really relates to what you've just been talking about around toxic positivity and what Avalon said about, you know, not playing cheerful music and music therapy if someone's overly sad on that day. And I think that's something, certainly when I was working in adolescent mental health and also in adult mental health, I think often people are told, um, people with mental health issues are told by well-intended family members and professionals to you know stop listening to sad music you know it's making you sadder and I think and often I would be called upon to kind of consult on these with these cases I'm thinking especially of like angsty teenagers listening to really angry music and um and you know and I and I know that the research supports this but when I was a new clinician I didn't know that yet and I was just kind of finding my way but what I learned as I spoke with my clients was that that music that to the to the you know third party sounds like oh it's so sad it's making you sadder or it's so angry you're, you're gonna hurt somebody if you keep listening to that music that ultimately people are getting a need met by that music and they're feeling validated they're feeling like they're not alone in the world um and it's a way to for them to express that and and to feel met in that and so that's a huge part of what I've learned. And so and it's not that music, like I said before, music can certainly negatively impact our emotions. We can get stuck in sadness. We can get stuck in anger and music can help us with the stuckness, which is never what we want. But that idea of first validating and then moving rather than just trying to change mood 
when someone doesn't feel validated. If I'm having a bad day and if someone just tries to cheer me up, I'm just going to get irritated 99% of the time because I need you to validate me first. And so, and my clients have really taught me that even with extreme music that sounds like, oh, that sounds like that's so loud and destructive sounding to, you know, maybe to that doctor or that social worker or that music therapist even, but actually people are getting a need met. And if we validate that and then work with it, it can be so powerful. So I think that's a big thing that my clients have taught me. And I mean, they've taught me so many things, but I'll just say one more, which is that um, also we don't always need to medicalize our relationships to music. So even for me as a music therapist, so I'm always thinking about music's therapeutic value, but also people need to have fun. And music is something that is so fun for so many people and is a distraction from the stresses of life that I have learned from my clients, especially those living in institutions, that they sometimes don't want music therapy. They just want music <laughs> because they're doing so much therapy already. And I've learned as a music therapist to really incorporate that as a part of my work, that if you just want to make music, that's enough. And, and that actually is linked to positive psychology, right? So um, that just to enhance all the really healthy reasons people make music naturally, rather than focusing on that more therapeutic relationship to music, but just what does music bring you? How does music help you naturally in your life? And that's where I can start as a music therapist. So those are a couple of things. Thanks for that question. No, thank you. That was super, yeah. super interesting. And I'll perhaps, I'll ask the question for Esther too, yeah. as we're wrapping up here. Um, and I, I will be honest, you know, as you're speaking about motivation and habit formation, that, you know, even as a music therapist, I have found um, this pandemic time challenging in terms of my own relationship to music. The choir that I sing in hasn't sang together in two years. Um, a lot of the places where I would access live music or um, would perform myself have all been shut down. And, you know, being, staying in that, um, and that place of feeling motivated to make music, even for me, has I found that challenging. So just to be really transparent, like um, music therapists aren't immune to this. So I'm wondering if you would have maybe like one tip for someone who is a trained musician, but is struggling with that, like, oh, like I'm just at home all the time. And, <laughs> you know, like to get back into that place of feeling motivated to make music for myself again. Yeah. That's a really interesting question and that's certainly like very difficult especially in this time it's hard if you're someone who's like really used to singing in a choir and then suddenly you have no choir and so what's the reason to sing right like I don't have the usual situation so I think um there's two things you could do here um from from what I think is um one is to just construct a situation where you're having fun you know, it's it's a, just engaging in this activity for fun. So if you're someone who likes to sing, maybe sing along like at home, just at the top of your lungs with something you really enjoy. That's pretty much what I've been doing all, all week with the soundtrack to Encanto. Just, just have fun, you know, find something enjoyable and try to reconnect with um, the activity that you do enjoy in a new and different way. And you may not like it, that's completely fine, but I think now is a great time to maybe try a few different things because certainly your original activity isn't as readily available. And that sucks, that's absolutely, it does suck. And you can absolutely recognize that like, man, that's awful, I hate that I can't do that. But at the same time, you know, finding a new way to engage in that activity can be a great way to keep it going in your life, especially now where, you know, you may be able to engage it in the future, but we don't know really when that is. So that's one way you could um, try to reconnect with it. The second way, I think, is to maybe try to recreate as much as you can from that original activity. So if you're someone who enjoyed singing in a choir, maybe trying to get a few friends together over Zoom or something like that and have a sing-along or something. I don't know if that's silly, but that might be a good way. Or schedule, like, I'm going to do a formal performance and I have to train for my performance. I'm going to sing to these seven stuffed animals and they're really going to enjoy it, but I'm doing my performance. So in that way, you can kind of keep up with a situation you really enjoy. Um, another way too with that is maybe find an opportunity to express yourself that is available now. Um, I think 
as we've kind of gotten to maybe like almost the two year point of the pandemic, there seems to be more opportunities that are available to us in the formats we enjoy. I think thinking about this webinar itself, I think this is a great way for me to talk about things that I enjoy in a way that I haven't really been able to in the last two years because we haven't been able to do talks or anything like that. So in this way, finding an activity like this that connects me to something I enjoy doing is a great way to kind of get back into that and to use those skills and to exercise them. So looking out for opportunities and trying to create them for yourself where you can reconnect with the things you enjoy um, might be a good way to begin. But certainly it is very difficult and it's, it is tough. Uh, but trying to, trying to understand why you started in the first place or what brings you the element of joy from that activity and connecting with that can be, a, I think, a good way to start. Awesome, thank you, Esther. Um, thank you both so much for participating. Um, I know I learned a lot and sounds like some guitars are getting dusted off. Um, I really like the idea of informalizing, especially for music therapy, informalizing the way that we make music too, just to have fun with it. Um, and thank you all so much to our audience. You all had some really great thoughts and questions. Really appreciate your participation and attendance today. So our next inspiring conversation will take place on February 24th, and the topic will be empowering racialized communities as research collaborators and agents of change. And that should be really interesting too. Thank you all so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.